This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Many of us in the first responder world are constantly searching for ways to feel more alive and not to be in a constant survival mode. Generally, we go through the motions of our daily lives on repeat, day after day. The repetitive cycles and stressful patterns often leave us feeling defeated, unhappy, unappreciated, and not fulfilled. There's more than one way to view our lives and our perceptions. There are tools to help us find happy, healthy, fulfilled life that we're all looking for. There are ways to transform your life and your view on your own personal reality. You can live in the moment, change how you feel, and live the life you really desire to have. And during the Badge podcast can help you navigate through those emotions as a first responder. You will hear stories from other first responders and their families. You will hear firsthand how they deal with the stressful life. You will also hear from other professionals that work closely with the first responder world that can give you the tools needed to thrive and get through those stressful trying times in this profession. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and with 30 years of experience and still on the job today, I want to inspire you to live a happy, fulfilled life that you really deserve. Now let's get right into this episode. So welcome to Enduring the Badge podcast, mm-hmm. season two, and Naya... Naji. Naji. Oh, I it's knew impossible. It, I, I knew I was going to get it wrong. I, I, and I was going to ask you before I even did this. <laughs> I know, I usually go over it, but that's uh, fine. The yeah. Y sounds like a J. It was totally not your fault. Where did so. that come from? Um, the smart ass answer is my parents, but, yeah, yeah. um, the slightly less smart ass answer, <laughs> only slightly, um, I'm the third kid uh-huh. and my older brother and sister got the family names. So as the story goes, my, um, my father was given the opportunity to name the third one and probably the last time. <laughs> um, no, and he, let's see, according to him, there was an adorable little girl. He went on his LDS mission to Central America. Uh-huh. There was an adorable little girl with my name, um, <clears throat> that he, he thought was just so cute. My mom's not so sure how little she was, but <laughs> whatever. So the full name is Najarit, um, which is incidentally a town in Mexico. Okay. Um, not that my parents knew that when they named me at all. Probably I was like 10 or 11. We met somebody from that town that was told us. So, oh. um, but yeah, it's N-A-Y-A-R-I-T is how that's spelled. So that's the full name, but that's fun yeah. to yell across the room. So Najee yeah. is short <laughs> and that's, that's what I'm with. But, oh. Well, there's an interesting lead in to the podcast. Go. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit about you. So yeah. tell us about your, so yourself, just tell us a little bit about yourself and then. Oh gosh! Obviously, you have some siblings. The, the fun stuff, yeah. So, middle of five. Um, okay. You know, good, good Mormon family, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, older brother, older sister, younger brother, younger sister, and I'm a solid middle right there. All right. Um, which, for any other middle children, sometimes they say they're like the misbehaviors, but I think they're the most well-rounded, right? That's there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so let's see. Born in just outside of Chicago, but moved way too young to even like claim it. Okay. When I go back, though, I'm like, it's my people. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you yeah, know, um, and then Southern California until, um, gosh, 11, 10, 11, 12, right in there. My memory's awesome. But um, moved up here to Utah. That's when I learned my parents lie. They, they told me the Salt Lake was just like the ocean. Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not, <laughs> not <yeah. laughs> anything like the ocean. Um, but otherwise, like, I, I liked it. So I lived here um, until kind of um, I left high school, went to college early, and then so Utah State, and from there met a boy, um, Idaho, because yeah, Utah State, we get lots of Idaho people. <laughs> Idaho, um, and then ended up um, moving with my, my first husband, Oregon. Um, lived there for a while and then moved back here and kind of been here ever since. I, I, I actually dig it here. I, yeah. I miss the ocean. I miss the beach, but I wouldn't move back to California. Right, right. So. It's uh, a little congested out there. Yeah, I always say I paid my California dues. Like, a great place to visit, <laughs> yeah. but... I was actually it, born there myself. Oh, yeah? And, what yeah. part? Um, Oxnard, Camarillo, Southern okay. California, and then I moved up to Northern California. Okay. And then uh, came to Utah and then moved back and then lived outside the Fresno area that's which made me never ever want to move back to California. Right. Sorry if you're from the Fresno <laughs> area and listening. I'm sorry, I don't love it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've been st- stuck here ever since. Stuck? Do you feel stuck? Yeah. Uh, not stuck. Sometimes I want I want to move at, eventually. Yeah. Just I want to go back east and live that lifestyle a little bit differently. Okay, that's fair. So yeah, I could I could handle a little bit more sunshine. 
Yeah, yeah. I, as um, I get older, I'm like, I get colder. I don't know what that is. Yeah, but. that's weird, yeah. You, yeah. you and everybody else <laughs> in Utah. <laughs> yeah. So you have an awesome practice. Thanks, yeah. And so tell us a little bit about your practice. So um, I'm from the Partridge Group. It is... Um, Mental health, psych services, evaluations specific for public safety, first responders. Um, started it with my former husband, who is a forensic psychologist. Um, and he um, definitely does like the, the clinical side of it. I'm not clinical. Uh-huh. Um, so therapy, counseling, evaluations, um, all of that is, is sort of his wheelhouse. And then my wheelhouse is like, I would say it's the skills side. Um, it's the, the preparing for the, the trauma and... Um, and stress and, and experience that the first responders go through. Um, <clears throat> that, that's a big part of it. And then, and then how to mitigate some of the negative, um, effects of it. Uh, you know, peer support I think is really big. Um, kind of a post incident response, kind of all, all of that stuff is where I kind of run into more, yeah, skills, more co- coach kind of yeah part of it. So is that more like more hands-on type more, I don't like classes. So <laughs> I um so yeah, if it Dr. P and and the other therapists that we have there are, you know, they do one-on-one stuff. Yeah. I do things more more in groups and more um like I said more preventative, more I I think I'm lucky I get the better part of it for yeah. sure. Yeah. Now, the therapy part though, like I love when I get to be in the office and um and I meet therapy clients, so seeing them um go through is like amazing. Like physical change in people that that come in because by the time we get a first responder in they they need to be in right? <laughs> we're, oh, we're getting better they, they say they take a long time to <laughs> recognize any signs we're getting a little bit better about it but um but yeah well and not even it takes a long time to convince them that we can do anything about it you know and but like you and it happens quick too. One of my favorite things about first responders is they're so dang resilient. I'm trying not to swear so early on. We'll yeah, be using yeah. my, my Utah words. <laughs> yeah. So dang resilient that um, the change happens really quick. We we don't get like I hear people like you know they got broken. No, it's not people that are broken. It's overwhelmed is what it is. It's they everybody in this line of work is so strong that they've been through more than most people could handle for sure. Um, which also gives them this false sense of security. I've handled all of this along the way, so I should be able to handle the next thing like everybody else does, right? Right. Because we also like to keep it very secret. <laughs> um, and so when it becomes too much, it, it it's hard to think that we could that it can be resolved. But um, but we really like it's it's like unpacking, just unpacking so much weight. They look lighter. They 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 look different and it, it's cool and it happens quick four or five sessions usually where like nationally I think that um they say a single traumatic event if you go in for intensive therapy after a single one mm-hmm. one big traumatic event it's like 11 to 13 sessions before you see like a difference which is still pretty dang good like that's better than living with your whole life yeah or something, right? yeah yeah um <clears throat> I mean that's like three months that's if you go weekly right? a lot longer than I thought um, yeah, that's nationally. Yeah. That's the average from a, a major, major traumatic yeah, event. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, an abuse or a, or a, um, you know, something life threatening, something like that. But um, our first responders, if you think about it, I mean, they've got like, you know, a few of those a day. But um, and and it's four or five. It's it's quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's pretty. The first session. Uh, yeah, they, there's like some relief and then there's some doubt about coming in the second time because they're like, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, super like any improvement feels so good that you're like, we're good. Yeah, right? I'm done. But, I don't need any more. Yeah, no more in them. Like you're going to think it's okay because it's such a big difference, but come yeah. back for the second one. Uh, the yeah. second one is, is a little feet to the flame um, <clears throat> and then and then you're off and going and it, it it's pretty awesome. I mean, some people definitely come in for longer than that. But if you think about a 20-odd-year career, we're, right. we're peeling layers of an onion. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was sort of like a little sidetrack. No, there. that's okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. So, yeah. So I uh, just thinking about that because I've been doing this like 30 years now and trying to unpack all that. That could take a really long time. Yeah. Do it, most people really stick to it? Do they come in and actually yeah, go yeah. through the motions? So uh, we um, – very, very few don't come back after the first one. Very, very few. Which, in a 
normal quote unquote practice, a, a practice <laughs> that is meant for the general public, the average number of sessions that people actually attend is one. Most uh -huh. people go once and don't like it or don't aren't comfortable with it or whatever yeah. and don't come back again. Um, but by the time we get somebody in our office, I mean, I always joke they're either looking for a witch doctor or a psychologist at that point. <laughs> they have tried everything else yeah. and they are ready to like, they're ready to, to get better. I mean, there's there's an adjustment. We're, we're changing a little bit. It's definitely getting better and I recommend maintenance for sure. Um, but <clears throat> one of my favorite things, like you said, you've been doing it for 30 years. I always tell people, um, before you retire, come in and unpack your closet. Yeah. You deserve it. And that's that, like, the job is about dealing with emotional and stressful situations in a less emotional way, I guess. We, we ask you to, you know, you show up to everybody else emotionally reacting and you're, we're like, no, you don't get to react. Right, right. Um, doesn't mean you don't have those reactions. You've just been very good at packing them away, yeah. right? And then throwing them in the closet, which when we did that class, yeah. that closet that you start to fill up and then the closet doesn't <laughs> shut all the way. And then you're spending your time holding this closet shut. And it's scary what's in there. I mean, it is, it, it, I wish there was a better way to, to explain it, but really it is frightening to think about what is hanging out in this closet ready to come get you. It's sort of like when you have, um, we'll, we'll pretend like neither you nor I have been through this, but, uh -huh. um, when you have bills, you can't pay. And so you get the bill and you put it like on a stack somewhere, like I'll open it when I've got money. Right. right. <laughs> and you like leave that stack there and you're like, it's not going to bother me because I haven't even opened it yet. But your bill, it could be two bucks. It could be 20 grand. You yeah. don't know. You haven't opened it. Yeah. Your anxiety about it is 20 grand, yeah. I promise you, but you're ignoring it. You're <laughs> pretending like it's not there. And um, there's so much growth that comes from opening the bills, making a plan, maybe selling the brand new truck and buying, driving a hoopty for a little bit, Yeah. Um, doing whatever you need to do so that you get through that. And the trust that you have in yourself in like, I can handle some major stuff, um, the, the, yeah, the faith that you that you get through i mean all of that like the growth that comes through facing it you're avoiding because it's just too scary yeah. but you know when you've got that stack of bills and you're like it's not bothering me except for you know you're parking your car somewhere that it can't be towed and you're like <laughs> taking a deep breath every time you turn on the lights yeah. right yeah it's it's bugging you it's weighing on you yeah and um <clears throat> for first responders one of the really devastating i think um uh, statistics is as is, is high as, and we haven't even gone into like suicide rates for first responders. It goes up after retirement. It's like 10 times greater risk in the first 18 months. Why is that? That's because fascinating. The closet. The closet. Do you think just, I, I'm, I'm guessing I haven't gone to any therapy, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. but I'm guessing if I were to unpack my, my closet, I would, uh, when I opened it up, I wouldn't really know everything that's in there. Right. It's pretty safe to say. Mm -hmm. Pretty. That's pretty. There's some of it that's, I'm sure, tried to come find its way. You know, um, I talk about the reel that every first responder have has, which is the moment that you are not busy with something else and your yeah. brain kind of like plays the video of moments, things that didn't get resolved. They got put away. Um, <clears throat> so you, you likely don't let the real play itself all the way out. Your right. brain also, um, only it, it's always trying to resolve what's unresolved, but, um, it kind of says, okay, you're ready to handle this. And one of the hard things, don't mean to scare you, is <laughs> you gain the strength from this and your brain's like, good, we're yeah. ready for the next one. <laughs> <You're> right, <yeah. laughs> and the next one comes and you're like, yeah. whoa. Um, and, and the feelings that you didn't think you were allowed to have, like the grieving of all of those lives of people you didn't even know. Right. Um, you often talk yourself out of being allowed to grieve those because they're not your people or whatever. Um, I was just doing my job. Right. Yeah. Right? Right. That, isn't it that done, what, what box first, checked, it's over. First responders right? say, that's mm -hmm. just part of my job? Yeah. Oh, yes. All the time. And um, and, and so, yeah, there's, there, I'm sure, are things hidden in the back of the closet you've completely forgotten about that yeah. didn't come out. But, like, so a couple, like, things that go into that, that suicide risk, um, a lot of first responders lose their identity in in the job yeah um i would say we take the best greatest human beings we can find human gold and what we've not done a great job of doing is taking these amazing human people human people 
yeah, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and growing them into first responders, what yeah. we've done is turned them into first responders. I we've said, that. forget everything that, that we hired you for, your empathy, your, your social competence, your let's forget all of that other really amazing stuff about you and replace it. Yeah. With the skills you need to be a first responder, which is it, it, outside looking in so silly because we hired you because of that. Yeah. Um, and so we, you forget how to connect with people. You forget how to um, make friends and keep friendships. You forget how to um, maintain relationships with your friends. You forget to do fun things. You forget how to have fun even. I would agree with that. <laughs> and then, and everybody thinks that's, that that's going to be there and waiting for you in the wings. No, it's not. It's gone. You haven't practiced it. It's not there. And yeah. then you became, for you, a firefighter, right? Yeah. You save lives. You go in in dangerous. This is what you do, and this is how you know yourself to be. Well, the minute that stuff's gone, what are you? Who are you? And how devastating is it to think, you know, I, I've heard over and over, when I retire, my wife and I are going to go do to the, <laughs> if your wife's still there, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, we I mean, talked about this in a, in a class. I mean, yeah, if, um, if any of those fun things are still even fun for you, Sure. But if you haven't practicing it, you go back to it and it does not feel good. It feels awkward and it feels wrong. And that's really devastating. And you miss the things that made you feel like you, which is the work. And then add to that the time, you know, you're not filling your time with the stuff you thought you'd be filling it with. That's fun. And now you have time and that closet is going to get resolved. It is going to come out at you. And if you haven't built the skills to handle it, if you don't trust yourself that you can handle it, that's scary. I mean, that's really scary. And, you know, um, <clears throat> one of the things I've been talking to people a little bit lately about that's kind of interesting is there's a lot of camaraderie in first responders. Lots, right? Right, right. Um, but it's really hard for me to see when people retire how few people show up to retirement parties. Yeah, that's true. How few people, like, this is my best friend. You shared 20 years with this guy that you've known for, or guys, gals, yeah. you know, people in the in the department. Um and when you're gone, you're gone. Yeah. You, and not because people are jerks. Um, it's because um, you have not built the skills to maintain social contact. What you have done is maintained work contact. Right. And it feels fun and like camaraderie. You joke around, you have fun. You talk about your family and your friends and, and it feels the same, but you've not built the skill of socializing after that. And you've lost it if you had it before. So whose job is it to build those skills? Um, ultimately the individual, but I would love to see that, um, as a whole, that departments are, are teaching, um, teaching resilience, I think. So we met because I did a class for, for Bluffdale, a very short class in my <laughs> mind, maybe not if you were sitting in the class, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's, and that's a start, but it was, it was 90 minutes. Right. And I always say like in your career, um, how much training do you get on tactical stuff? All the time, every day. Yeah, fire. Both, both like, police and fire. Yeah, I, you are training all the time. How right. about policy? How much are you getting on policy? Uh, plenty. <laughs> right. Physical. For, yeah, fire, you're getting, you're getting so much training. Tons yeah. and tons of training on everything it takes to do this job, right? How to use the apparatus, right? Yeah. Little yep. training on, on that. Yep. Lots of it. All the stuff that you have available to you, how to, how to use everything, right? And then how much training are you getting on your brain? Uh, I want to say little to none. Yeah. I have what, yeah. discovered that like late in my career though. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. we none. take it for granted, right? Because we hired really amazing, smart people um, with, with great, great resilience, um, great, you know, emotional and mental health. Like even if you're not getting pre-employment psych testing, doing this job tests your resilience yeah. pretty quick. So we take it for granted and we go, it's there. But it's not there to the level that we need. So how often do you use your brain on this job? I'd like to say every moment. <laughs> right. How how important is it to be able to tap in to your brain, like your mental flexibility, to be able to go through all of those skills that you've learned and decide which one applies here best? Or how to take one of those skills and 
um, go extend it into this situation? Because can we train every situation you're going to no, see? No, no, definitely not. I mean, we always say, like, never say you've seen everything. Please right. don't. Right, yeah. No, I, <laughs> right? I've kind of thought that a few times. I'm like, you know, after I mean, doing yeah, it so but... long, and I'm like, no, no, <laughs> that'll be next week. Something mm-hmm. new will come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we could never train you on everything that you need to know. But we can train you on, like, enough that these smart people can use their mental flexibility, their resilience to apply it to every situation and make really, really great, good, quick decisions. But without training mental flexibility, without training resilience, without that, really what we're doing is causing, like, this whole tunnel vision. And you have a limited limited set of skills you can get into. I mean, we know when something traumatic or... or stressful happens I mean we kind of like shut down and go with like really basic basic stuff right yeah, yeah. but if you can take control of that really quickly and kind of be in a space that you can tap in you're ready for anything um so yeah I'm hoping that that using your brain is something that would be useful every moment of every day but we don't train it I agree I that's that's actually why well the one of the biggest reasons I started this podcast and stuff like that and you know, future of writing a book is just skills and like, yeah, like you said, you just drill into all those things. But the most important thing is your brain, right? Oh, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, you gotta have the physical capabilities to do this job and stuff like that. But it's just, it, it's mind boggling to me. Can robots do your job? Uh, well, part of it probably. <laughs> probably a part of <laughs> part it. Of it. But, but truthfully, if you're not human training interaction. brains, robots are doing the job. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a part of it. But, yeah, human beings. We hire good humans. We need good human beings to do the job. Um, I always say one of the most devastating things I can think of is if on my worst day as Joe Q. Citizen, my worst day, the most devastating thing happens to me. I lose a, a loved one or, or somebody's injured. I call in a first responder, and the people that I get that show up don't care. Why don't they care? Because um, they've been taught that that's a weakness. Even though we hired you to care, <laughs> even though we made sure you cared, even though the only reason you would ever consider this job is because you actually like people. Now, I know 30 years in, people may agree, disagree <laughs> with me, but getting into this job, the people that are drawn to this job care about people. Now, maybe there are some people that think they're going to look great and they want to be on the fireman calendar. I don't know. Yeah, I'm um, sure there's probably some. But they get weeded out pretty yeah. quick Yeah, because the job is not as glamorous uh, yeah it, 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 it yeah, look. <laughs> yeah it's the people that care that show up and care and then if we're beating that out of them like that's that if i lost a child and i had the first responders show up and go like, another dead kid you know that happens yeah that, that's horrible you know and it means to me they're they're not using everything they can to save my kid you yeah, know yeah and that they're dismissing the value of this and and all that that's but for some reason what and not for some reason, because we didn't know better for a long time. Um, we've, we've, we do the eat our young. We, the old crusty guys and gals <laughs> lovingly call them this. Um, they, um, they see the new people and they, they see how much it hurts them. And not because they're jerks, but because they care, they tell you to suck it up. Because they know, like, if you keep getting hurt, I know what this experience has done to me. You won't survive. So right. we eat our young. We, we basically, if they don't look strong enough to do it, we're, we're like, we're going to toughen you up. Let's rub some dirt in it and move on. You're, you're suck it up, buttercup. You're not going to handle, handle this if you don't, if, if you're going to emotionally react to this. It's so backwards. It's so backwards. But we didn't know how to teach people to handle the emotional reaction we didn't know we didn't know that resilience was taught we've always for years and years um it's it you know recent science uh, relatively recent like yeah. 20 odd years we've known that resilience is is a skill we've started to figure that out especially in the last five to ten years really like honed in on how the brain trains and works um to learn that resilience is a skill but prior to that which how long has first response been around oh man yeah. forever since the beginning of yeah. time we hired the people with the most resilience and treated it like a uh, like a usable commodity basically we need the most resilience to come in and do this because we're going to use it up on you right yeah and that was basically what we did we said 
you know, you're going to have to toughen up or else you're not going to make it 20, let alone 30 years. Um, what we can do now is say, yeah, I recognize that that hurt because I've been there and oh, that hurt. But rather than let it ruin your whole life, rather than let it ruin your relationships with your family, rather than let it keep you from caring about the next person that shows up, rather than letting it numb you to the point that you're a shell of yourself, let's talk about how to do this job and then as part of this job manage that emotion so it's safe to care. I feel like there was a time in my career that I felt like a, a shell of myself. Yeah. For sure. I, like I, I, Is that typical in a career that you would just kind of – I felt like in my career I – Right, I came in with empathy and compassion and mm-hmm. and cared about everything and tried to help everyone. And then as time goes on and I would start working multiple jobs as a first responder, like probably every single person listening mm-hmm. works multiple jobs. And then it just burned myself out. Right, exactly, yeah. And then, which burns myself out both physically and mentally, so I don't care as much. And then once I kind of recognized that and uh, started trying to be uh, more compassionate, I had to give up some of those other jobs but like and learn the skills. Because you're playing catch-up real... at this point, right? Yeah. 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 I, I truly believe that most of the people in, um, in these jobs have the capacity to do probably all of that stuff if we prepare them for it. We don't prepare them for it, so then you're playing catch-up, and you're trying to relearn things that are gone and refill in your shell. And, and not only that, like manage the consequences of that, the lost relationships, the, all of that kind of stuff. That's a lot to deal with. That's, that's an added trauma on top of it is, is the, the things that the effects that it has on your life. Um, but if we can train people in advance, I think people can handle so much more. In fact, the research shows that the two greatest, um, indicators of post-traumatic or post, you know, impactful, because I think traumatic, sometimes people go, That wasn't really traumatic, (laughs) right? But impactful. We have all these situations that are impactful to us. Um, Having a positive outcome versus a negative outcome, the two greatest indicators are things that happen before the the incident, nothing that you do afterwards. It is feeling supported. So having a good support system that includes, you know, your department, your colleagues, your family, your friends, and yourself. Um, Being able to trust and support yourself too is important. And then being prepared and trained for it. So being prepared for an impactful situation and what the outcome looks like, what it feels like. Um, And then having that support means you can handle kind of anything. I think that's kind of interesting. I I would have never really put that together like that. That's Because everybody wants to know, like, we had something bad happen. What do we do now? Yeah, and you're like, yeah. That's you're so far behind the yeah. curve now, yeah. right? Like, yeah. how am I going to bring somebody in to, to support you if you don't trust anybody? Yeah. And if you've learned you can't trust people. If you – and the number one, to be able to trust anybody else, you have to trust yourself, right? And we do this thing with first responders. I love, love what I get to do. Like, I have the coolest job ever. <laughs> I work with the greatest people ever. And one of the reasons I say is because – if, if let's say you believe in God or a higher power, what where the, I guess the place that first responders hold themselves to their, their mark of whether they have succeeded or not looks like this. They show up to a situation where they know nobody. They know nothing about these human beings. These human beings did not exist to them before they showed up. Right. That's true. There's a situation that has been brewing for quite some time, likely. Right. You know, whatever it is, the the interactions between one person and another, a choice somebody made, whatever it is, these things, this situation has been brewing for a long period of time before you even were aware that it happened, right? You show up after this situation has reached a critical point, right? Something bad has happened after all of this brewing. These people we don't know, these situations, the choices, the like, I mean, if you think about it, it's like lifetimes of choices. If you're talking about like a drunk driver, it's like what led that person? I mean, like all of this stuff that you could have no idea about, none. You show up to that situation and make it your job to change the outcome. If God himself did not see fit to change that outcome and you show up on that situation and don't change the outcome, you failed. Right? Yeah. That's the, that's a good way of looking at that. It is. I I mean, mean, uh, mean, yeah, no, 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 no. No, I love you (laughs) for it. Yeah. Um, But that is the standard you're holding yourself to. Yeah. 
how easy is it to trust yourself to go? I've been through all of this training. I have life saving skills and I failed. I mean, cause that's your mark. Your mark is, did you change the outcome? God did not change in right. this situation. Right. You didn't see coming. Right. You failed. So are you trusting yourself? So the next time you're like, am I going to be able to handle the next thing? Like I did all the training. I did everything right. And I still failed. So are you going to trust anybody else? Are you any of that? So getting back, I'm so like all over the place That's here. That's okay. But this is good. So getting back to that situation, <laughs> if something happens to you and it has an impact, it's traumatic or impactful in a negative way, and we're like, we need to get in and support you, who do you trust? And generally, you're going to bring probably... me in? <laughs> I'm going to come in and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I totally yeah, trust her. You're she, right. right. No. Yeah. If you haven't built a relationship of trust with somebody, they're going to come in and you're going to be like, yeah. I don't mean to, yeah, but you're yeah. going to be like, yeah. whatever, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And if you did not know what this reaction looks like when it happens to you, it is scary. Right. It's not what you're used to. So um, one of the and I've seen it happen. I have uh, one of the guys on one of my peer support teams um, went through kind of a big critical incident. It was an officer involved shooting. And he called me afterwards, and I will tell you in my class, so I, I work with Highway Patrol. I do their um, their new hire class in-house. So I meet with them once a week for six weeks until they're sick of seeing my face, I'm Good sure. Good job for Highway Patrol to, <laughs> I love to them put it up to, yeah. to doing that. And, um, and we kind of go, like, so basic stuff. Very, very, very basic stuff. But um, I, you know, get people in my class from the whole range of, like, suck it in like sponges and, like... Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Can't tell me anything. So this gentleman was a yeah, right. I mean, he was he was very kind to me. Like I liked him because he I like people that'll like push me and question me because it gives me the opportunity to kind of share more with people. And um, but he military, he'd been through. I mean, not sit home military. He was yeah. like, I mean, not that there's a lot of sit home military, but you know, yeah, not during deployed peace times. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, he'd seen some stuff. He'd been through some stuff. He'd managed a bunch of stuff. Um, and had like tons of great resilience skills already. He really did. So he kind of was like, I guess this is for the people who haven't seen what I've seen really. Um, but, um, so he was in this, this incident and he called me afterwards and was like, it happened. Like you said, like uh, the things. And so if, if I'm feeling like this and you told me we can fix it, we can fix it. Right. And I was like, yes, yes. Success, success. And that was the thing. But otherwise, feeling that is scary. It's so beyond like that lack of trusting yourself that all of that is frightening. And the last thing you want to do is admit it to anybody because you know you're the only one feeling it, right? That's the other part with first responders. Right. We're all too tough. Yeah. And you have that like image armor <laughs> yeah. where like you have to like – because the job is you, – you support each other and you back each other up so much. So there's this culture of evaluating each other. You are doing it to everybody else, so you know people are doing it to you, right? <laughs> if I'm in a crisis situation, who do I want to have back me up? Yeah. You're thinking this yeah. through. You're watching people do stuff and you're like – they better not be the person I need to ask for help, right? <laughs> or like, okay, yeah, I got that guy. You know it. And so you also know that when your that your experience is being judged by everybody else. So even like in the fireplace uh, fireplace in the fire <laughs> department where you come in and I know you guys do it around the kitchen table, like that was a tough call and you'll talk about how it was a tough call and whatever, but you you limit it. Yeah. You're 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 all kind of like going eh, he said that okay i can go that far like he's okay i can admit that far but you're holding stuff in right you're never admitting the the, the extent of it well you know sometimes you are because yeah. it's not but but if they're if it's beyond what anybody else is admitting you are certainly not or if the person that admitting it we all know is the guy we don't want backing us <laughs> up we're not saying we feel the same as him right yeah and so um you're like i'm the only one it's all it's only me like, why am I the one feeling like this? Why can't I be like, you know, people are trusting me to come out and do stuff and I'm failing. Like I, and, and it, it eats at you and you're like, it's just me, but it's everybody, everyone. Like if I learned anything in doing this, you all are so normal. <laughs> how, how do we, so if we're all feeling this, how, how do we open that up or how do we crack that shell into, to getting um, people to go a little bit deeper? So, I have, um, and he's let me, I don't use a lot of names, but Paul Cotter, Lieutenant Paul Cotter um, with Highway Patrol. He's retired now, retired Lieutenant Paul Cotter. I love this man. Love this man. He was in an officer-involved shooting. He got shot in the ass, um, fired okay. back. It was 
uh, it, I mean, kind of the worst, worst day, right? And he, um, I, I occasionally get to see him speak, but he gets, he talks about the most courageous thing he's done is had a conversation. This guy is a badass. This guy got shot in the ass and is returning fire. Yeah. He, I mean, like, this is like movies are made of him, right? He's, he survived it. Like, if you've seen the, if we have younger viewers or, or squeamish, <laughs> you know, cover your ears or whatever. But, um, he is, there was blood pooling in his boots from this, this shot. Um, and lived through it. Like, it, but he says, mm -mm, most courageous thing I did was talk about it. And that's, that's exactly it. People Who did he talk to? Oh, well, originally <laughs> he came in my office. Um, yeah. And we joke, we're, we're, we're friends now, but, um, department sent him in, um, to do a post incident debrief. We did a, because it was part of um, an investigation, we did it, he did it in the office with the, the other officers that responded. I mean, very traumatic, like colleagues, he'd been an officer for a long time with them and the other ones there had all been, been there a long time. So, um. So they did it in the office with, with Dr. Partridge. It maintains like the highest level of confidentiality that way. It happened a long enough ago that people, I mean, it was really still very new. He was not super thrilled about coming in. He'll tell you that. Um, uh, are any of them? <laughs> no. No. We have coffee and dogs and like a really cool massage chair and still. <laughs> still people are. <laughs> but but I, I've, I've lived to learn about this. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But um, yeah, he, but um, we, we pushed at him. We nagged him. I'm not going to lie. Um, but it was, yeah, getting in and, and being with the other guys that were able to, and I wasn't in that session, but they were able to safely talk about it. Um, and that kind of started to, to make a shift. It, it takes time. Um, Tear down the walls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like dipping your toe in and making sure that sharks don't bite it off. Yeah, right. Like yeah. you got a little at a time. And, um, but I think, and, and seeing the impact it had on other officers when he was able to talk about it, that, that kind of stuff is, is what does it. Because one of the greatest things I love, I love peer support. I think it's like, if you don't, if you're not doing peer support, do peer support. It needs to be happening because you're using a resource that's there, which is experience. Um, but being able to talk to each other. So his, um, so he joined the peer support team. Um, and I think it was really, he really appreciated that people since then have really appreciated being able to talk to somebody who's been through stuff like that. Um, and, and it kind of grows on itself. It's, so it's being able to back to the, back to the trust factor, right? Mm -hmm. That he's yep. been through it. So I can trust him. Yeah. And they and know he, and him. he knows. And, and yeah, like if we can get supervisors willing to admit that they've been through stuff, it makes a big difference. I think I was um, in a class and there was a discussion coming, talking about kind of how do we start talking about it. And um, and people are, are willing to share it, but then ooh, we haven't been taught how to share it, right? So I had an FTO, uh, a police FTO that um, had a, um, a guy he was training. They It was a suicide by train, I think, that he that they went to. And, um, and he's like, in the class, he's like, I told him, I said, you know, I can see this is really hitting you hard. Let I, you, you can talk to me about it. And he's like, my FTO was like, no, I'm good, sir. I'm fine. And he's like, why would he do that? Like he was not fine. And I was like, well, let's, let's walk through this. <laughs> like, let's think. So the guy that you are trying to emulate that, you know, is like writing a review on you, right. That is right. like, you probably respect you're looking at and going like, I want to be him when I grow up. Right. Like mm -hmm. this is who yeah. I want to be. He's saying to you, you look like you've got a problem. You look like you're messed up. You look like you're too weak to handle this. I mean, basically, like yeah. that's, he, he did not use his words. He was, he was kind and, and said, you look like this is hitting you. What do you, what do you need? And who's volunteering to that? Who's going to be like, you're right. That <laughs> totally <laughs> messed me up. No. Yeah. And I, so I said, how did you know? Like, what did you see in him? What, what? And he's like, oh, I remember my first one. And he had that same stare that I had. And I was like, that's the words go when this happened to me the first time. That's what I looked like. Yeah. That's what I went through. To make it okay. Make it relatable. Yeah. Make it okay to say, yeah, it hit me. Because then they can look at you and go, oh, wait, so you're still a cop? You're still a fireman? You're still doing this? You 
were impacted or affected by something and you're still like, look at you standing there like big badass still, right? Then it's okay. So it's okay for me. Like that makes it like, oh, right. Then, then what'd you do? What? And the other part is, is because we don't like to talk about it. Every, like so many people have clawed their way to some sort of something to get through it. Like first responders have some skills. They have resilient <laughs> skills, not because we've taught them, but because mere survival, they have fi- had to figure some stuff out. And what I love about peer support is it starts to allow you to share those with other people. The thing that you had, the crisis that you had to go through yourself personally, right? And the lessons you had to learn, the things that you learned the hard way, like not the easy way, you clawed for and begged for and, you know, got beat up while you were learning. Why does everybody else have to get beat up to learn it? Why wouldn't you share that with yeah, them? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. In, in, in this line of work, I, I was liking it to like a manhole. Like if there's a manhole in the road and you're walking down the road and you fall down the manhole and you like dig out like hand grips and you find your, you know, dust yourself <laughs> off and you, you claw your way back out of this manhole. Um, what cops and firemen like to do, or first responders as a whole generally, um, they get out of this manhole, brush themselves off, like didn't happen because yeah. no dirt on me. I'm good. Right. Like maybe you're see that? You, yeah, right? you twisted your ankle and then you see somebody else walking down the street and you're like, I hope they don't fall in the manhole. Right. Yeah. But you don't say like, dude, there's a manhole right there because how do you know there's a manhole right there? You'd have to admit that you, you, yeah. you saw it, you fell in it even. Right. So we would do this like, he's getting, Oh God, he's in the manhole. Right. Yeah. And then when he's in the manhole, you're like, dude, that sucks. <laughs> right. When you could be like, Oh, dude, manhole, there's a manhole. Don't fall. In- oh, you fell in the manhole. Right. Some will, will not. Some. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got some hard heads right here. Some <laughs> of us have to be kicked to learn. But once they fall in, are you going to let them like dig new hand grips? Or are you going to be like, listen, brush yourself off, feel around like, you know, how tall are you? We'll say six yeah. foot high. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's a grip somewhere. Yeah. Feel that grip. If you can feel that grip, that's your start. And then the next one. Why Why wouldn't you get them out quicker, everybody? Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I know I'm as you're saying all these things in my mind, I'm like replaying in, incidents and things that have happened in my career and whether I did do that for somebody or didn't do that or how I feel like I can do that now. Mm-hmm. I, I'm thinking it's, you know, you're talking about trust. You have trust in yourself. I'm like, I'm to a point that I trust in myself and I, I feel like it can be pretty much an open book and stuff like that without if you judge me for what you want but you know i'm just gonna say how it is and because you've built that trust in yourself you're like i can handle this right but my job doesn't define me that's what it actually took my job doesn't define who i am good that that's so so valuable like how many first responders their job defines them i would tell you you are better at what you do because your job doesn't define you took a long time to get there though yeah i would give anything and everything for the fire department and police department and it's you, counterintuitive and then you, yeah and then you're like uh when i'm following that manhole i'm like uh, is anybody reaching for me from there right yeah like let me help yeah, yeah let yeah. me help pull you up even it's it's totally counterintuitive um but it but it is the way so part of i think why i've done what i do and, and why i'm fairly successful at it it's because I've never been a fireman or a cop. <laughs> I know that's surprising for anybody looking at me. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> and I never will be, and you're all welcome for that. Yeah. Um, but I do care deeply about it, and I spent a lot of time trying to understand it before I even started trying to do anything about it. Oh, I'd um, say you have a pretty good understanding. I, I worked on this really side hard over here. for yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but is that I also get the outside looking in perspective. And I saw, like, we hire people that care. We hire people with all of these amazing skills. And then we tell them those are weaknesses. And, you know, people, for lots of reasons, get into that where the job defines them. They are the job. And what we're doing, essentially, is now we have robots doing the job. They're not as good as humans. They just aren't. Right. Um, And that's, robots can do a very rote set of skills they can't apply them kind of 
I guess they're getting better, but um, <laughs> <laughs> still not going to replace the human. But this job is contact. so dynamic; it requires human contact, and that's when we go back to that whole um, where that standard you guys hold yourselves to. I like to remind you that, like, even if you didn't change the outcome, you made a huge difference. Like, you forget that the show up, the show up is so huge. The show up and care is, I think, what uh, you know argue all you want but first responders are professional carers I, you care where other people don't or are afraid to care you 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 care yeah i for quite a while i, I felt like i had to be perfect and still do to a, a relative <laughs> and how do you define <laughs> that what perfect uh, is sometimes your peers define it for you <laughs> right well because one of the best ways to like um defend against people looking at you is to point at other people yeah. for sure and and not like in an asshole way at all. It's right. sort of just like in a human, just natural, yeah. natural way. Yeah, it's a defense mechanism that some people like. If you're already like questioning yourself, and then somebody else questions you, that is really like hard to take sometimes. And if you haven't built the skill to handle that, almost without even trying, you'll you'll deflect that. Yeah, I, uh, and I I actually brought it up to a couple of the guys on the department, you know, about feeling like I have to be perfect, or you know, you look at baseball players, or they hit three or four out of 10 balls and they're like, whoa, they're all stars. They're mm-hmm. amazing. And we don't have that opportunity to, to do that in our line of work. Right. We have to, we feel like when we get up, we always have to hit a home run. You're superheroes, so per- right? Yeah, we have to be, that's where I feel like you have to be perfect. You, you can't fail. You can't make any mistakes. Everything has to go perfectly. Or and there's one, like, you feel like crap or you're being judged or that or you didn't get the outcome that you wanted. The layers of, of that judgment too. Like it's, I mean, yourself, your coworkers, your supervisors, the department, the city, the rest of the community, like everybody, like you're a superhero. Why aren't, you know, superheroes save the world, right? <laughs> and let, let's not forget that like, you know, for 20 minutes of a day, they, they save the world and then they hang up their cape and, and deal with life and get to be themselves yeah. right even like superman was like clark kent and had a relationship and <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and stuff you know um but yeah you, this or maybe it goes the other way like the the community the city the department the supervisors to yourself that holding yourself to that that perfect standard yeah but i i argue that you make a lot more difference and you do a lot more right than you let yourself see i think Even in a situation where you show up and a life can't be saved, you didn't fail. You showed up. I mean, you showed family members or community members that a stranger will come in and mark a human life. Like, you, I mean, how many times have you performed CPR or tried to save a life that you you knew was not savable? Yeah. Why, Why did you do it? Were you hoping for the miracle or were you doing it because... This family needed to know that this life was worth everything you got. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both, you know, at times. I yeah. agree. Well, we're hope hoping for the... for the hoping for the miracle and then right. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a it's very traumatic for a family when you arrive and you're like, sorry, we can't do anything for for them. Mm-hmm. So that's... And yeah, you I mean, this nobody that you know and you will do I mean, do everything. Um, t- to try to save. And that I think is so, it's so valuable. It's that situation where you didn't know the people, you didn't know anything else and you're still willing to, I mean, it's the, everybody talks about the running in, but that's yeah. big. Let's, it's not a, it's not so much what happens once you get there. I trust you that you've got, you're doing everything you can. It's the fact that you're willing to go in there. It's the fact that like, when I call, someone will show up. Yeah. I mean, that, that's huge and you forget that you make a difference there that that is actually a win um it's a win for for everybody else that sees it i think i went and did a debrief for a um a county that had somebody had died in custody in in the jail first in custody death that they'd had and it was devastating for the for the corrections officers and people always are like it's a bad guys in jail we you know they're they're throwaway people right but these corrections officers are tasked with taking care of these people in their um in their care and um it was it was a gentleman who had spent his life basically destroying himself physically um there was no coming back from this it was not anybody's fault it was the accumulation of all of the stuff he'd done to himself uh, just 
the turkey timer went off in the jail, basically. <laughs> and, um, but I think like even for the other inmates that saw the correction officers show up to try to save this guy's life. Like, I think like even for those guys to know, like while they're there, while they're, you know, in their, their shit storm of what they're in, it's still a human life. You yeah. know, you guys don't show up and go like, eh, that life's not worth saving. Right. It's I mean, true. Sometimes you may see. think it like this guy did this, but you don't. Yeah. It's, you still show up and, and take perform. care of them. Yeah. 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 It's and um and I I wish more people remembered how much you guys do. That that's the training behind everything you do to be ready for anything. All of that stuff is all wins. That is all the outcome we don't get to decide. We just don't. So I wanna jump into some kind of the let's go into a little bit of statistics about uh, oh, yeah. I'm really good I, at numbers. I, I, Let's I know, see what I got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> about su- about uh, first responders and suicide. Um, so the suicide rate that I have heard for law enforcement um, is anywhere from 50 to 60% greater than general population. Um, a fire is not that high, but you're doing a good job. You're catching <laughs> up, yeah. right? Which is kind yeah. of, uh, yeah, it's horrible. Um, but that statistic, when we say it, I always like to add a little bit of information to that statistic because right. 40 to 60 percent greater than regular population is astronomical to begin with. It's huge. Um, so some it's not a, a totally reliable number. Uh, often people think it's um, it is underreported because you guys deal with life and death very well. You see a lot of it. Um, there are maybe some deaths that are deemed accidental or otherwise um, that you might have the skills to make it look like that, right? Yeah. Um, so, so probably underreported <clears throat> um, that number to begin with. The other thing that I think is worth noting is is greater than regular population. Regular po- population, um, and so for law enforcement specifically, in the United States, it's at least, I think, 80 to 90% of all departments do a pre-employment psychological evaluation on any officer before they're hired. Even if they don't do this evaluation, the job itself often looks, I mean, it's not going to look at everything in the psych eval, but we look at resilience. We look at suicide. You'll see suicide risk. So if somebody gets hired as a cop, their suicide risk that is tested in a psych evaluation that use psych testing that is admissible in court like like any medical testing. So this isn't like <laughs> random juju. I don't know yeah, how they do yeah, it, but it's yeah, good. It's yeah. um yeah, psych tests are admissible in court where like polygraphs are not because psych tests are prove proven that that I guess true. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Didn't know so like down to a science. Yeah. Type. Yeah. So if a cop gets hired, <laughs> their suicide risk is nothing. We don't hire cops with a suicide risk because we know what we're doing to them, right? Right. Um, so zero, their suicide risk is nothing. There's a margin of error, which I think is like 2 to 4% depending on the test. So maybe a 4%, maybe, right? It's pretty low. Um, in the United States of healthy non-clinical um, population, so people who are not in mental health um, facilities or being treated for mental health stuff already, um, do you know who gets psych tested? No cops <laughs> teachers don't get psych tested doctors don't get psych tested psychologists don't get psych tested just so you know um and a lot of firemen <laughs> don't yeah. yeah but we're testing you on on the job so yeah. I, I like to say even if if you didn't go through a psyche eval, but if we're talking about the numbers the, this this leads to the numbers but even if you didn't go through a psyche eval, as far as your resilience it gets tested super super quick um, if you're, if you don't have a solid amount of resilience when you start this job, um, you're not, you're not lasting. You're, you're out pretty quick, right? There's yeah. A, yeah. 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 There's a flash that happens. Uh, yeah. In, 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 uh, law enforcement, especially if I feel like it's a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. People I wonder. Yeah. Get tested a lot, a lot different than in the fire service. I think the test is a little bit different. Yeah. Oh, that makes so sense. So it washes yeah. them. Yeah. Washes them out. A little Wash bit is better than flesh, huh? Yeah. I said flesh. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, but if we look just at the numbers, so you had a 0% um, suicide risk when you start this job. Um, regular population is not psych tested. So we are saying compared to a regular untested population, their risk is 40 to 60% greater. That's insane. Yeah. 
That is That's astronomical. Huge. That also speaks to what are we letting how are we treating people in this line of work? What are we missing? It goes back to why are we not teaching them resilience? Why are we not teaching them how to do that? Like, how do we, and there's a whole big, I mean, we could go on forever, but you know, if workers comp is covering things like PTSD injuries or PTSIs and, um, you know, cause it's been, people like to, to, you know, if there's a suicide or if somebody gets injured, injured psychologically, um, we like to go like, well, they just couldn't handle it, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. no, we tested them. They had no risk. If we did something that they matched the risk of an untested population, like what is the suicide rate in, in the United States? It's not low. No. So if we matched that, matched it, that itself is just the growth there of that suicide risk is, is insane. And then we passed it by 40 to 60%. Astronomical astronomical and you have to say there's got to be something that we're doing to them that's causing that like that that's not or, like some risk yeah or like, not, like like random not doing for them right right, right. yeah it's it, human beings are not meant to handle the level of trauma your job is stress and trauma most human beings can handle a thing or two that happens to them right it sucks but they get through it, most of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a, a fire chief actually tell me once, this was awesome. Um, he <laughs> said, it's not the job that's killing my guys. So I got brought in by HR, which is always the best way to be introduced, right? Uh, yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so I come in, all five foot two of me, I was probably wearing heels, five, six of me, um, come in like, you know, HR is like, so she's going to talk to you about how <laughs> there had been some suicides in this agency. And, um, and the fire chief, uh, crusty old guy who actually cared about his, he, he cared about him. I know he did. I don't know if his guys knew he cared, but in talking to him, I know he cared, but he said, you know, what? it's not the job that's killing them. It's their, their personal lives. Every one of them that have killed themselves was going through some stuff at home with their wife. It's the wives. I'm like, <laughs> ooh, wow, ouch, a ouch. Yeah, yeah. And be, um, let's talk about that. What, like, how many people get divorced in this country? It happens all the time. Right. Does our right. suicide rate match that? Everybody that gets divorced kills <laughs> yeah. themselves? No. No, it's survivable. It is. So, A, what, what made that the, the tipping point? And B, what led to it? Right. I'm glad I'm glad you're getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> if we are changing the human being, like I myself, if I married somebody that turned into a completely different person that was a shell of themselves, maybe not and and let's go beyond that, a shell of themselves and then had changed into like high stress and angry about stuff and not sleeping and and didn't know how to have fun and didn't know how to connect with me and when I tried to I said you don't even understand and pushed me out and when I was like you look like you're hurting they got pissed right <laughs> um I would be like whoo I got that was a bait and switch somebody <laughs> yeah, somebody pulled yeah. one over on me that's not who I married well right? I, I yeah I, I can believe that because I see guys come into the department and mm -hmm. they change yeah and I'm uh, my personal opinion and not clinical by any means is like i i feel like the divorce rate is going to be higher for someone who became a firefighter or in law enforcement or first responder like before they had gotten into that relationship so if they had if they're like been dating and then they got in this relationship and they knew that they were dating a you know first responder oh, like and got they'd already married. Met somebody that was in that yeah yeah uh, you're probably seeing much less of that change, so you right, kind of know what you're getting right, into a right, little bit, right. maybe. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I'd have to check, but I, uh, you know, the so one of my uh, peer support people, she made me laugh, but she's like, I'm gonna find it for you. But when she was in the academy, they're like, so the suicide or not suicide, sorry, the divorce rate in the United States is 54 percent. In law enforcement, it's double that. And she's like, <laughs> it's 108 <laughs> percent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. You're gonna get divorced two times. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, um, I was laughing about that, but I was like, yeah, it's definitely higher than regular population. I don't yeah. know exactly yeah. the, the number, <laughs> um, but lots of people get married and divorced repeatedly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no judgment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, it, it's, I mean, lots of factors can play into it, but, but we. 
we we lose that that ability to connect and to care and to stay in it and and to be understood like we we push off people trying to understand us yeah so he brings you into the department blaming it kind of on the Mm -hmm. the things that are happening at home and stuff Mm -hmm. and what was your response my response was well let's talk about why that's happening at home let's talk about what happened to these uh, you know i told you one of the things we were terrible that i wish we did better at is we hire amazing human beings and rather than maintain them as human beings and grow them into officers because that's what we all should change throughout our life like you do not need a department of rookies that's a nightmare right Yeah, yeah we want growth but we don't want growth at the expense of all of this stuff. We want growth, not change, not, not yeah. like this switch over. Um, but so the other thing that, that I think leads this, because people like to blame the shift work on the, on the doors. Lots of people work shifts. It's the same 24 hours people get, right? You, you can adjust. <laughs> um, but um, we, we do the same thing with families and support systems. People who get into this line of work understand, like, when we test, do the psych test, we look for social competence. We look for, so that they know how to make friends. They like people. They, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, empathy, all of that stuff. Um, so they, they generally have a good support system in place. They've got friends. They've got family. They've got relationships. And they know how to build those, right? And rather than grow that support system that they've got by the, the the support system that they can get within a department, which we've heard about, like the brothers in blue and the brothers in red and that yeah, camaraderie yeah. that I love, that I think is great. Um, so many people switch it. They change it. Like they've gotten rid of their old selves to become this. They get rid of their old support system. They close them down. They become so, well, they become so... <laughs> first responder specific they um they lose track of connecting with other people they they stop hanging out with their friends that aren't in this line of work when their family says you know what happened they're like you will never understand what happens yeah. right like yeah and so you start to switch this out you also like make we haven't, we haven't even gotten into like the um neuroplasticity the way our brain actually changes and how right. it feels to connect with people um but what we what we've done is taken um, support systems and traded them for this other support system that's not bad, but it's not whole in, in within a department. So you you trade it for your your brothers in blue, your or brothers yeah, in red. Yeah, or, I can see that. that. And um, but when shit hits the fan, you still need that support system. Like we said, what are the things that you need? You need a support system. And it needs to be like whole. It needs to be all of this. It needs to include the people in the department, but it also needs to include your people at home and your families. And so, yeah, kind of I went back into the department and um, what I what I taught briefly in that class that I do a whole bunch, what I did was that uh, mental health continuum that looks at the way – people change behaviorally um, based on exposure to stress and trauma without um, resilience coming in to help mitigate that. So we went in and talked about that. Um, it's it, it's a mindset that a lot of people are, are using to kind of wash their hands of the responsibility of what this job does to people. I was at a um, FBI conference for mental health and resilience, and um, it was up in Chicago a couple years ago, and the commissioner up there did the opening statement and he's a good guy chicago has a lot of i mean there's it's a huge department but the suicide imagine. rate there is really high um in that department it's huge and it's i mean there's a lot of if you talk about support they are they have so little support from the community and from um the government but um they're, they're trying to solve it and the the commissioner said some things that i thought that were well-meaning but i really felt like it is that thing where we we wash our hands and don't really like dig in and go what are we doing what can we make a difference on and he said um kind of to, to echo what that fire chief said which was um you know he said we got to figure out what we're doing for the families which i think is true um we can definitely teach families how to be part of the support system but but you guys got to let them be a part of it too, right? <laughs> um, he said, we got to do something for the families because so when we were there, there had been four um, suicides like right in the, the week prior to when this conference was. And there was another, a fifth, no, there had been five and there was a sixth one the day after he spoke. And he said, of the five that had, um, that had killed themselves, it wasn't the job 
In fact, the job was the, the thing that kept them going. They wrote letters. Four of the five wrote letters into the department that said, this is what has become my home. Wow. Um, it's not you guys. You guys are my family. It's, and then blamed the, the, the actual family. Yeah. Right? Um, and he's like, so we got to do something for families. And I'm like, yes, yes, we do. But that's not okay. Right. It, right. That's not okay. That's the fact that we think it's okay that like their family is the department. No, because uh, I'll tell you every one of those guys, you know, that, that saying their, their job was open before their obituary was posted. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. not a family that's yeah. giving back. Right. You know? Right. Um, so yeah, I went back into that department and that, that, and what we did was we talked about, what because it happens slowly you don't you almost don't see it happening um the changes that happen that happen to you the behaviors that that and it seems normal and it seems okay and you're like just tonight I'm not going to talk to you like tonight I need a break tonight I need to skip the basketball game tonight I need to skip helping my kids with soccer tonight I like just tonight was too much and then it's like tomorrow it's like I'm still tired from the day before and um and I go into it kind of more in in the classes but um over time it starts to change and like we change even what feels good. Um, I say the things that, that we recognize to be love and under, to be love before you get into this line of work that we know how love feels, right? It feels yeah. good yeah. to be loved. It's understanding, it's connection, it's attraction. It's all of that kind of stuff. Right. And you know it, you guys are good. You have good integrity. You totally understand how love and feels and connection feels good and understanding feels good and, 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 and attraction feels good. But over time when you come home and like, you're too tired to like, even look at your spouse, right? You're like, eh, whatever. And <laughs> you know, you're not, maybe you're tired, too tired to get stuff done that you promised them. So now you're like, you know, you feel like they're nagging at you to get stuff done, but you're like, you don't even get like how tired I am. Like, give me a break. And they're, they, you're not telling them. Right. And so they're, they start nagging, quote unquote, we'll say nagging, but they're like, <laughs> they're trying to get you to be what they knew you to be. Right. Yeah, Just, yeah. And they, and you're like, that feels you know, like doing that stuff doesn't feel good anymore. It feels like there's something like, you know, even like expressing my attraction to them, there's something behind it. It's like, I'm supposed to meet some mark. It's all this pressure. Like you're like that. It doesn't feel good to do that. And like the, the connection, the things that you guys used to do for fun, you don't have time for, you're too tired for it. And again, it's, you're not practicing it. So it's, it stops being something you're used to or stop it's been something that's fun and the understanding, right? Like when they are like, tell me, and you're like, you don't understand, right? Like shutting them down. You don't get that understanding. So understanding and connection and, and attraction doesn't feel good because you're not practicing it. It feels, it starts to feel gross, right? Like it's a skill you've not used and skills you don't use are no right. longer your skills. Yep. Right. They <laughs> They're memories. and go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, if you ever learn to play the guitar and then stop playing it, you probably aren't that great anymore. <laughs> um, and so, so those skills don't feel good anymore. Even though they did your whole life leading up to it, you didn't even realize because you were use, using them all the time. Um, and so when somebody, when you get home and somebody is begging to love you, begging to connect and begging to understand and begging to just like something you're like ew like it feels terrible and so you you kind of it doesn't feel right it doesn't feel like love and we sometimes trick ourselves into seeing other things as love um things that you're more used to things that draw adrenaline things that um you know if you have somebody at home nagging at you to like be who you used to be and you go to work and there's somebody there that's like, you know, that nurse at the ER or the, you know, that's like, oh man, look at how great you did here. You know, like, look at, I get what you're doing, you know, yeah, like, yeah. it, you, it confuses you, it tricks you. Um, and, and that starts to feel good. You guys run on so much adrenaline, things that produce adrenaline feel good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so y you're tricked. It, it's confusing and love doesn't feel the same. Connecting doesn't feel the same. It's why you feel like you've got this great support system at work, but it, it, it's not as deep as it was before because you're missing understanding and, and all of that yeah. kind of like the, the feel goody stuff, the stuff that, um, that we know is good for our brains, the oxytocin, 
right? That's oxytocin. the right one. I always use the wrong one. <laughs> the oxytocin, the serotonin, and, and, yeah. the, um, what is that DHA is that, that like growth hormone that comes from like yeah. hugging and loving and, and like connecting with people. Um, you stop getting that and you run on this other stuff. I mean, that, that, that it changes you. So does it change your brain? Yes. Absolutely changes your brain. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, so there's this uh, science that's kind of um, new, relatively, I say new, brain science. We're learning so much about brains. Like, I love it. That's one of my favorite. That's cool, right? I love neuroscience. So, yeah, neuroplasticity. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, essentially what it is is your brain changes based on um, repetition and focused attention, right? So from the moment you're born until your brain is done developing or growing, its main focus is to learn like lots of things. It builds lots of synapses and connections, lots of skills get built in your brain, right? At some point your brain stops, you stop growing a brain. Um, and it's kind of a, a, it's, it's set as far as the resource, how big it is, what, what it's there. Um, and we used to think that like, there you go. Done and done. Yeah. That's what your brain is. Congratulations, right? Um, you're smarter, you're not. <laughs> yeah, right. It's why we didn't used to teach kids more than one language, right? But now we know if we teach kids multiple languages as a child, they're going to have they, they can they can get that. They actually have like this the capacity to learn all that. Um, but what we learned from um, brain injuries is we learned when somebody has a traumatic brain injury, it like physically stops a part of their brain, right? And what we learned is other parts of the brain can pick that up, can learn what that brain, what that part of the brain should have been doing. We can reteach it. Like, so if somebody's in a car wreck and they can no longer tie their shoes, right? They're 30, 40 years old. Um, it used to be like, well, I guess he's, you know, brain damaged, <laughs> yeah. done. But we now know in many things we can relearn this, we can reteach it. So then in looking at that, we looked at how how that happens and it can happen kind of both ways if you stop using something it will also die off so like a skill you no longer use right mm -hmm. um if you have a traumatic um incident like a, a yeah majorly traumatic incident it can actually have that same impact on your brain um as if you had a physical injury to it it stops that stuff um because you're needing to use different skills so um the way i teach in the class is we you know, we hire, we hire you with all these amazing skills, your, your, um, you know, empathy and social competence and, and all that good stuff. Right. Um, you are a solid golden human being when we hire you. Right. And then we teach you how to do your job. Right. And we put a lot into this cause it's, it's really specific skills. I don't know another line of work. I mean, maybe like medicine where there's a lot of pressure on knowing this stuff and it is like, everything like you must get this you have to get it right we're like reinforcing it all the time you're home practicing it all the time you're thinking through it like well you're what if and you're doing all mm -hmm. of this stuff over and over and over and over and over again right and um and you're not practicing the stuff that we hired you for the connection the the kind of that <laughs> stuff that the human the human stuff. side yeah and then um but that's okay because you can learn stuff right it's harder but you learn it and then we send you out there to do this job and you're doing it over and over and there's so much behind it and there's so much importance to it that you start to overbuild these skills, these, you know, skills required to do the job. Um, things I, like we don't always think about, but things like being very assertive, things like, um, yeah, shutting down, um, kind of the, the emotional reactions and, and, and that kind of stuff, you get so good at it. And then we reinforce it because there's a life on the line behind it and your job and not just life, like your job, supporting your family. It's important, like this stuff and you're being exposed to it over and over and over again. And where most jobs, it's like, it's a stressful, big project. It happens over weeks or whatever. This is your stressful, big project is like right now and then it's the next one and then it's the next one right so you're getting tons of this and you are overbuilding those skills and you're overbuilding them into like sort of a negative kind of thing like a so they're overriding your brain it's that focused attention and repetition right mm -hmm. so you're getting focused attention and repetition on being assertive in, in this because you show up and you have to control a situation right manage right. it right so if you overgrow your assertiveness it turns into anger Right. And it turns in. So where you can like show up and like, you know, take control of a situation, be in charge of something, <clears throat> um, which is it's a great skill. But now most of the time I, I, they're like roads. So usually it's a skill on a road that when you get to the, the place that you need, you take the exit on that interstate. Right. 
but it's a three lane highway, whatever there's exits, you know, it, right. You start to overbuild this, it becomes six lanes. You're putting so much traffic on it that your brain is like, we really need to make this a really great road. Cause I'm using it all the time. It's so important, right? Focused attention and repetition. It's going to start building this up in your brain in order to do that, because it's a limited resource, it will take the resource from another skill that you're not practicing. Um, maybe having fun with your kids. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, um, your brain goes, well, we need this resource here. We're not using this other thing. You'll remember, you'll still have a memory of it. Um, but you don't have the skill. They'll take the skill and move it over. So if it's a growing need, your brain will actually pull the resources from the skill or the road or the synapses that, um, that you're no longer using to p apply towards the one that you are using. If it is an immediate need, like a major traumatic situation that you're like, right now things are changing, got to fix it. It will actually demolish that road. It does not exist anymore. You have a memory, but it's not there. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. And it will overbuild this other road. So if you normally have a road that you go like normally, you know, 65 miles an hour down, you can <laughs> see your exits. When, when you get to the point that you need to be, you get off, right? But if you overbuild this road and it's six to eight lanes wide and you can fly down it going like 180 miles an hour, you're not <laughs> seeing exits. You're not even building exits yeah. in. You are immediately there the minute you get on the road. Assertiveness is anger. It is no longer a, a useful tool. It's no longer I'm being assertive to get to the, the, the point that I need. It is you're just angry. It's your reaction to, to something, right? And so if you've killed like having fun with your kids and now you're really good at being angry. Yeah. When your kids are like, hey, let's kick the soccer ball around. <laughs> and even if you're like, sweet, let's go kick the soccer yeah. ball around. Or like I've seen all where people like you miss your family. You, like you think fondly of your children and you get home and you can't stand them. You're like, I'm going to play a game with them. And then you're like these little, <laughs> I can't, they're horrible. Like I, you, it's because yeah. you lost the skill of connecting with them. It, it's gone. And it's so hard to accept because you remember it. You likely don't remember building that skill to begin with because it happened when your brain was in the growing stage yeah. that it, it builds. Um, but, and that, that's, that can be so, so difficult, but we do that in like lots of ways. We overbuild, you know, we, we get a lot of anger. We get a lot of depression. You guys deal with a lot of sad things, right? So you have to get very good at being sad and dealing with sad things. So we see a lot of depression happen. Um, anxiety is one of them. We teach you the what ifing, the what if game, yeah. right? You get very, very <laughs> yeah. good at what if Pre-planning everything. What We're always pre-planning. What if yeah. that? What if, what if, what if, what if? Because your job is to, to predict the future, right? Yeah. And to, so that you can see what possible consequences they are and mitigate them before they happen or whatever, right? Right. And so you get so good at that. That's anxiety. Like if you can't just like sit in the space that you're in and you are constant, constantly wondering what could happen. I mean, that, the, the, that's a complete loss of peace. But, <laughs> I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm wondering out there, who's not thinking that? Who's not going through those things? So I'm like, <laughs> Do you remember you, a time when you could just sit and enjoy something? Uh, I honestly don't know. I'm on the spot thinking about it and probably take me. Most nice. people, like, so, and I'm, I, this is one of these skills that I learned in my life from completely other things. I'm, I'm a what ifer too, <laughs> definitely. And I always thought it was weird, like, that, um, like when I'd go on a trip, I get like trip. I love to travel, but I get okay. trip anxiety. I have to think about anything that could possibly happen. What could happen to my house? Do I need to turn off the water? Do I need to turn off the gas? Do I need yeah. to, you know, make sure the neighbors are checking on stuff or my kids, you know, if I'm leaving my kids, I'm like yeah. all of this stuff. Right. And I like reinforce it because sometimes something happens. One of the 10 billion things mm -hmm. I thought of actually happened. And thank yeah. goodness I thought of it. Right. Um, but there are people in this world that literally pack a bag and leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm getting better, actually, at that part <laughs> in, in my life. I'm like, there's stores, there's things. I right. like, uh, yeah, I have to tell myself every time I pack, card. I'm not going to Mars. Yeah. Because I'm like, what if I need this? <laughs> yeah. what if, I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. Mars. They will have a store there. like, Or yeah. I will live without it, right? Right, but, right. Um, but yeah, so it, it kind of builds into in, into that. So we, we end up with those kind of traits. And yeah, it's wearing. What? That's wearing. Like the, all the what if like constantly. Mm-hmm doing that it just wears on me yeah throughout it's, the day. it's exhausting it will it will wear you out and the truth is is it doesn't make you better at addressing it yeah it it actually makes it harder because when you need uh, to address yeah. something you don't trust yourself to get it right you go through every thousand ways you could possibly handle something yeah it doesn't make us better at it who would have thought 
<laughs> nobody. nobody nobody when you're in the middle of it no, you're like nope i'm yeah. the best what if forever yeah so <laughs> how, how do we build the resiliency so um i there, know that's probably a really um, whole podcast in itself i'm sure it's totally buildable and it's totally a skill and i think that's like number one the most important thing to know for a long time people just thought you either had it or you didn't but it's a total lie so resilience has a lot of like pieces associated with it um mindfulness, which I know is not a word that, that first responders love. So let's go with <laughs> situational awareness. It's the same thing. Yeah. So situational awareness in be where you are. Like I heard a term in the military, be where your boots are. Um, so being really cognizant of the situation that you are in and what you can manage in that situation, um, <clears throat> will keep you safer and keeps your brain flexible. So, um, situational awareness, self-care, um, which is, I like to say self-care, it, it's so many things, but, um, it's not just massages, although yes, yeah, for sure, <laughs> right. but it's, it's anything you do, uh, the things that you were before kind of you were impacted by something like this, um, things that make you feel whole and like yourself, love and connection and, and, um, being able to trust yourself and, um, you know, feeling confident and that stuff. So sometimes it's paying your bills. Sometimes it's, um, you know, maintaining a schedule. Sometimes it's, it's keeping promises to people. Um, so self-care is, is any of those skills that, that we often lose in this line of work, um, connecting, understanding, building relationships, love, joy, happiness, those friendship. Those are skills? Yep. They're absolutely skills. Yeah. We think that like, because the moment you're born you, the only skill you have when you're born is fighting to stay alive. Everything else you've learned in like a perfect world, you learned it by holding your mom and dad's <laughs> hand and you walked through like in families, you learned how to like, you learned that you can fight with families without it being like devastating world, right? Like you can fight and still care about each other. You learned how to resolve conflict. You learned how to be connected with people, how to understand, um, that people can understand you, you learned, you learned love, you learned joy. The reason you get that hormone dump as a teenager is to learn to be attracted to people. <laughs> it's a skill. Um, you learn what's fun for you. You learn all this. So these are all skills, right? And you need to practice them. Um, I always say we hired you for these skills. We give you plenty of practice in the other skills you need to do this job. Plenty. I promise you're getting yeah, it. Yeah. You're getting all the practice you need yeah. in assertiveness. You don't need to practice with your kids. <laughs> right? You are getting all... It just comes out that way. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's because that's what you got really good at. Why wouldn't you use the skills you're good at? Yeah. When you're yeah. in a situation, you're going to use what you got. Right? Yeah. And so that's why that comes out that way. Yeah. Um, you know that I, I always say that um, critical thinking such a great skill, but you guys overbuild it into cynicism <laughs> and, and cynicism is, is, is weak. It really is. So I talked about, it turns into that road that you don't have the exit. So mm -hmm. critical thinking, you've got the exits, you know, when you got where you needed to, like you thought through something, when you become cynical, you gave up. You basically said, I do not trust myself to handle the situation. So I won't let it happen. Um, we do this like heartbreak. We talk about it. Like you get, you know, somebody breaks your heart. And if you become cynical, you're like, everybody out there is an <laughs> asshole. Yeah. Everybody's going to cheat on me. Everybody's going to lie to me. Everybody's going to da, 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 da. So you don't, you're not going to date again, right? That, yeah. That's the easy. Yeah. You become cynical that way. You gave up. You, um, I see in kids of first responders a lot that they are not trusted by their parents. Um, and I think like, you know, you raised that kid, right? <laughs> why, why don't you trust him? You know, and yes, they're kids. They, sometimes they lie. Yeah. But as a parent or as a person, if you do not trust yourself to discern when somebody is lying to you, if you do not trust yourself to handle that when you find out, what you do is you don't let people talk to you, right? Yeah, right. So you've got kids that should hopefully trust you because if kids have to tell you something, you want them to be able to talk to you, right? Right, yeah. But if you've taught them if your lips are moving, you're lying. <laughs> That's... <laughs> You're That's not talking bad. to you, right? That's bad, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, okay. So building resilience. So, um, there's, it's you, if you've lost a lot of these skills, you have to go back and learn them and it feels awkward and weird. It feels like learning anything and nobody likes that. Um, but when you first became a fireman, like what was one skill that was hard for you to get down that you had to practice a lot? 
Oh, just the like medical, like the doses of okay. of drugs. And stuff. So the doses. Can you yeah. do it now, like in your sleep? Yeah, a yeah. lot of them. <laughs> yeah, right. So what you did was you went over and over and over in your oh, head. Yeah. You're like, this is never. You went over and over and kept going, and you're like, this is awkward and this is weird and this doesn't feel right or natural or good or anything. But you kept doing it until now. It's so easy for you, right? Yeah. If you've lost some of these skills, you have to go back and practice them, and it doesn't feel good. Like connecting with your kids, you have to sit and listen to them. When they say stuff that you're like, oh my God, I know, just rant. Can you get to the point? Yeah. Please, a point, like right now. Because that's what how yeah, we listen right. to people, right? We're like, right. point now, what do I do with it? Gone, right? Yeah. No, if you want your kids to be able to talk to you, you have to sit and listen to them talk. Endure the story. And it feels horrible. <laughs> it feels like when you were trying to get those, just like, this is never going to be okay for me, ever, <laughs> right? But if you listen to them and you practice listening to them, you will start to actually be interested in it. I know that's weird. But <laughs> you'll start to like care about if everybody was wearing pink shoes to school. Yeah. Like you're like, that's pointless. No one cares. <laughs> yeah. But if it's important to your daughter. Yeah. Eventually, if you listen, you'll, you can start to like rebuild that. Um, having fun, like all the time people, uh, we talk about used as, what'd you used to do for fun? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. you do this for fun. You do that for fun. My, my used to is skiing. I, um, I loved I, I will say I love skiing. I love skiing. Ask me last time I went skiing. Yeah. Yeah. And um and it got to where so I have I had brand new skis in my trunk two seasons ago. Brand new skis. I love skiing. I live like in Utah. It's awesome. Um I'm not a good skier, but I've always enjoyed <laughs> it. And last season, this season was weird, but last season, um, I don't know if you know, but we had a stellar season. Yeah. I heard. You heard, huh? I heard. Uh oh. Yeah. I have been telling people I love skiing. I love skiing. <laughs> and I had opportunities to go skiing. And it went like this. It's so cold up there. <laughs> because last year was the year that skiing got cold, right? Yeah. I talked to myself. Yeah. Or it's all the way up the mountain. I live in Utah. It's 25 minutes yeah, away. Yeah. It's all the way up at the top of the mountain. Because that was apparently the year they moved skiing to the top of the mountain. So I had to... Um, <laughs> So I learned that that fun skill for me is when I, I killed. I need to get back out or find another one. Um, but that's what that's what happens with it. You put it off long enough and it no longer, you're going to find excuses for yeah, it. Yeah, talk if yourself you, out of it. Yeah, if you love camping and you're like, I could, you know, throw my tent in the trunk or in the truck and I, I'm out and I'm gone. Yeah. And now you're like, I love camping except for you haven't been in four years. <laughs> yeah. And when you think about it, you're like, I got to put up a tent and I got to figure out. Pack you killed it, and, right? Yeah. yeah. So you have to go back and find stuff that, and it does not feel good to do. So I always recommend go back and do the things that you used to do. See if you can find that moment that you forgot everything else was going on in your life. You're going to have to push yourself. You're going to have to pack the tent. You're going to have to drive 20 minutes up the mountain <laughs> to the ski resort <laughs> and be cold or put some warm clothes on. I don't know. But um, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to bust through that and kind of keep practicing it and try new things too. Um, and look for that moment that you forgot everything else that was going on. If you found that moment then do that thing again and keep building it and let it be as awkward as when you were learning the, the, the doses yeah. until it, it just comes to you naturally. So, um, anything that makes you feel loved, connected, um, confident, any of those things, those are your self care things. And yeah, don't just, I'm not just a massage. Those are great, but think about kind of everything that makes you feel good. Like you accomplished something you connected with your kids. you I mean, like having your kids look at you, like, like they trust you that's a self-care that's that's an important skill so what do you need to do to, to get there and do that um <clears throat> it is um dealing deciding what you have control over and what you not what you don't have control over so practice um kind of letting things go that you don't have control over another good resilient skill is letting people care about you and take care of you really bad advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so bad and here's the trick is you guys are so good at taking care of people that when you're like i'm gonna let somebody come in and take care of you they will screw it up it won't be right because you're so good that you're gonna look at them and be like you suck at this but you need to start practicing it before you need it because that is the only way they're going to know how to come be your support right so you need to start talking to the people in your life and letting them know what you need and letting them screw it up a little bit. Do it when, when it, there's not a lot on the line so that when you do need it, they're, they're ready and available in a, in a way that you can trust. 
um, trusting people and trusting yourself. <laughs> you can only trust someone else if you trust yourself first. And one of the best ways to learn to trust yourself is to start unpacking that closet and realizing you live through it. Um, it's doing the hard stuff that you've written off as unimportant. Um, yeah. And going, okay, I didn't die. You know, going out doing that stuff. Um, it's, and, and, you know, resilience, I, I, you do need your physical body to count on it. So good nutrition, good exercise. That's where I struggle a little <laughs> bit, but, um, those, those are all skills related to resilience. So, um, kind of like your mindset, um, it, it is huge. That's, that's what you have control over your mindset, your self care, self care skills. I think all this start there. Um, and, and support systems, make sure you you're starting to build and you know what your support system is um, and that they know who it is too. Uh, boundaries building and, um, and your own boundaries and helping other people with boundaries with you is, is, is really important. It's a really good relationship skill too, but until you understand them yourself, you can't work them with other people. <laughs> um, but it's a great way to build trust with people is to, so trust is built on met expectations and trust is broken on unmet expectations. But especially in a lot of relationships, married people do this all the time. It's awesome. Or they, <laughs> um, they think, because I love you, I want the greatest thing for you. I, I know exactly what you need. I'm going to do it for you. And because you love me and you want to do the greatest thing for me, you know exactly what I need too. And so many times, and not just marriages, but like, but that's a big one because, yeah. you know, yeah. everything comes to service in a marriage, right? right. Um, you put so much effort into something that, um, that you think is important to somebody else and it's not, and you have wasted effort and not done the simplest thing you could have done for them. So talking about what your expectations for each other is so huge. It seems so unromantic. Like the romantic <laughs> thought is that I married a psychic who knows exactly yeah, right. what I need all the time. But the more romantic thing yeah. is, babe, I don't need you to clean the garage. I just need you to help me carry groceries in. Yeah. Right. Because the cleanest garage on earth, if I don't care about it, but I'm carrying groceries in by myself while you're watching sports, I hate you. Yeah, I don't right. care if you spent three weeks cleaning the garage for me. You know, yeah. it, but but if I haven't said it to you, it's yeah. Eh, yeah. All the all the spouses, the first responders are like, yeah, I love this episode. It's <laughs> <is> so true. <laughs> but it, it goes both ways too. I mean, that's part of the thing is you stop trusting first responders, stop trusting their spouses. But you got to help them learn the skills. You know, you can't go in and say you don't understand. They're never gonna understand. What are they gonna say to you? Are they gonna say like, oh no, I know what a dead baby looks like? I mean, unless they are also doing something like this. No, they don't. They don't yeah. get it. Um, and it's too much to ask them to get it. I don't care how much they care about you. If you are not helping them learn that, then they, they're not going to be there for you. So start small, let people screw up <laughs> and then get better with it. Let them, them come in. If you've been the one that says you don't understand, if you've been saying that, go home and say, can I help you understand? And let them screw it up. Because they're going to. Like, oh, well, well, that's, well, we're all control freaks. Wait. Mm -hmm. How's this going to happen? Right. Which is a trauma <laughs> response. If you are used to trauma and stress, the, the number one, I mean, OCD happens because your job is now to manage everything, right? Yeah. And so that's, it, it, but it's a lack of trusting yourself. So you're going to have to start to trust yourself if you're going to trust anybody else. <laughs> Which means trusting yourself is you don't have to know how this is going to turn out. But do you trust you can handle it? Yeah, it's big. Right? Like, I've been talking to a lot of people that are with the, the COVID thing that's happening right now. Um, and it's a lot of first responders um, are not talking to each other about it as much as I would like them to. But what I'm hearing from them is it is overwhelming. And not that anything bad is happening to them, but it's that they don't know how to prepare for it because nobody was really, nobody saw this coming, right? Yeah. Nobody's been through it to know how to handle it. And so they have lost the one thing that they had, which was control, right? And the, the lesson if, and, and I'm going to be totally honest, I myself have hit that, that moment quite a few times too. Like, this is too much. It's <laughs> overwhelming, right? But what I try to remind myself, the lesson I think is, is not, is, is that we actually can handle it. If we, if you can step back and go, you know what, I don't know what's going to happen next, 
but I know I'm going to be okay through yeah. it. I know I can handle it. I know, you know, I don't know what this next call looks like, but I'm really damn good at my job. When I get there, I'm going to get through it. And instead of going to a call where the life wasn't saved, if you can take that time, this is part of that mindset, if you can go back through it and go, life wasn't saved, but what did I succeed at? Then you will start to see where you really can start to trust yourself. But you lose that trust in yourself because you've had that un- unmakeable mark. And, and and then you're like, I'm screwing up. I'm screwing yeah. up everything. When you were really doing everything so, so well. Um so that's, that's a part of that mindset thing. Goals are really important. Um, keep track of your goals. I always say um, when I teach resilience, I start with goals and not just work goals, personal, professional, family goals. You want a whole bunch of goals. Write them down and check in on them. I think it's a really good habit. It starts with that, that brain thing that we're doing is check in on your goal. And it's really easy to go like, I screwed that up. Yeah. Right. Um, but when you look at your goal, you, you can give yourself room to improve. That's fine to go like, I could do this better, but look for where maybe you've made some, you've maybe achieved that. Um, first responders come in to make a difference often and get burned out really quickly because they feel like they're failing. Yeah. And if you're like, no, my professional goal is to, um, you know, to make a difference. Where did you make a difference? Remember the show up. Remember the the part where um, you know a newer, you know a rookie saw you do something and learned from it. Like these are differences that you're making. So kind of keep that's that mindset. And when you're doing goals, I read this thing recently that I was like, that is genius. Um, make sure your goals, your motivation is bigger than your goal. So the weight loss. Lots of people like to talk weight loss. If you're like, I have got to lose fifty pounds, but you really right? (laughs) Like I got to lose 50 pounds and you're like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. And then every night you're like, dang, I had a cookie today. Yeah. Right. Maybe your goal is to only have cookies two days this week. Right. That might be something you can do. Right. But if you go every night and you're like, I did not lose 50 pounds. Like that gets really frustrating. Right. right. So make sure your motivation goes beyond the the goal. So if you have a big goal, break it down into smaller goals, Um, check in on them regularly and look at where you are achieving. Look at where you're succeeding. I want to be a good parent. When, you know, did your kid come ask you for help? That means that they think you can do something, you know, Um, you can go. Yeah. Maybe I had less patience with them than I should have, (laughs) but they came to me. Yay. (laughs) Right. So how do we grow on that? How do we build on that? That, that helps you see where you are successful and helps you build that trust in yourself too, and not lose sight of what you're actually doing. Cause that's, yeah, robots don't have goals. Robots are kind of doing rote over and over stuff. But if you have an idea of what this looks like for you in, in long term, um, then you can keep track of it and you can keep yourself on course easier too. Awesome. That was a great episode. Um, <laughs> it was like forever long. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I know it's the a, worst part about me is I could talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great episode. I, I, I know I feel like a lot of spouses are going to really dig this episode and just like. So you can throw uh, my contact information yeah, up too. Because like every, if you're looking to rebuild skills, I say give, get a hold of me. Um, that's probably the hardest thing is if you've lost, lost skills, rebuilding them. Where do you start? I'm happy to kind of give examples and, and talk through that stuff. That's that's kind of awesome. And here in Utah, you do uh, you do some free uh, group stuff. So free group classes. Um, I do. I'm well. I, when I can, I, do, I definitely do do training. So I work with a lot of departments here, and I work with departments actually across the um, the country and do some training and stuff. Awesome. Right now, so I'm terrible online. Like, did you guys notice? But, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I am trying to adjust some things so I can do some like live classes. I'm working on a, a four week resilience challenge, which um, which will be free, um, and basically it'll be kind of those resilient skills that build on each other. So we do we talk about a skill one week. It will be I, this is this is the thing you're gonna have to interact a little bit with me in a minute. Um, but we'll talk about a resilient skill um, kind of what it is and then and then there's some challenges some things you can do that week to start building that skill and then the next week we'll kind of build on that kind of what would you do to do that the next skill that kind of goes on top of that so it's four weeks long and it's be- meant to like start building those habits and start rebuilding those skills Great. So, where, so where can people find you um okay so let's see my email address um which we should probably put up but it oh, is 
Okay, good. <laughs> it's Najee Partridge. It's N A Y I P A R T R I D G E at gmail dot com. Um, it's probably the the best one for that. Um, my cell phone number. I'm putting it out there, people. <laughs> it's eight zero one two four four zero 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 two. Um, I do. I give out my cell phone number everywhere I go because the resources are slim for first responders. Yeah. And I always say, if you have run out of resources, you've not called me. But what I've done really, and we didn't even get into, is when um. When I've seen a need for a resource, I either try to find it or build it. And that's, that is, this was never my life goal, <laughs> but I love it. I'm so glad. But I got into it because I saw that there was a need and I looked for the, who was filling it and there was so, so few resources. So, um, yeah, by no other methodology, methodology, whatever. It's nice. Totally said that backwards. Anyway, then, um, me having an officer or somebody come to me and go, this is what I'm struggling with. And trying to find the answer for that. That's kind of how I we've built. So that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take call, text, whatever. If I don't answer, it's cause I'm sitting down <laughs> doing something like this or doing, but I will, I will get back to you for sure. Or you can email me. Um, yeah, bear with me. I'm not the greatest at technology, but I'm definitely going to have that in the next week or two that, that four week class kind of going. Um, and I'll probably limit it to a few people, but if we have interest, I'll open up another session of it. Perfect. So. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we'll Thank get this you. up and aired soon so they can uh, take part of the class. Awesome. I appreciate that. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Right. Thanks for listening to Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I want to personally thank you for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of me at Jerry Fire and Fuel on Instagram. And also you can reach out to me on Enduring the Badge Podcast on Instagram as well. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show represent our guests and hosts alone. 